Lane is a nutritionist, food scientist, and personal trainer who's worked in the food industry for many years, from product development technologist to fruit picker, professional taste tester, and everything in between. Annalene currently works at the University of Melbourne in the Faculty of Veterinarian and Agricultural Sciences as a researcher and lecturer. Annalene will be talking about the value of food and how far we have come from recognising what value is. Please welcome Annalene.
But I do like fresh sourdough. I do like fresh sourdough with some butter and some Vegemite um, on a, for breakfast on a weekend. It's just absolutely delicious. I love it. But yeah, that would be so inappropriate to serve at a wedding. When the food that's served at the wedding is pretty much a reflection of both the personalities of the bride and groom, but also the value that they have for their guests. The veggie might sandwich doesn't quite cut it. The food we consume is both a reflection of our values, ourselves, how we see the world, and also the people that we interact with. It's more than just something that's a temporary pleasure. It's extremely important. It's a direct reflection is probably not something you see too often in Australia, except maybe on the news every couple of months or so, or on a World Vision ad. Uh, this is a five-year-old child, believe it or not. It's a fierce hunt of growth. It's no more than a two-and-a-half to three-year-old. It's a feeling malnourished. This was taken in Fiji. I was part of um, a food initiative program that we were doing in Fiji in 2008, and we went to some extremely remote villages. Now, I'm talking so remote that their kitchen is on the side of a local creek. Their bathroom is the creek. Um, they get their water downstream from their bathroom, which is the creek. Like, it's just absolutely remote. No electricity. They live in shacks. The village is comprised of a family, starting with grandpa and grandma. They're seven kids who got married to the village down the road and they've had two kids each, and that is your village. Okay, so really remote. Um, some of the places hadn't actually seen um, people from outside of Fiji at all, so we had to have an interpreter in a couple of places. Um, so really, really, really remote. So really malnourished. Now we went in there, we dropped in some food, we dropped in flour, rice, tea, canned fish, powdered milk, sugar, salt, stuff that has a, a good shelf life that doesn't need refrigeration and, and you know they were very appreciative of it definitely but we also gave them a couple of egg laying chickens and a variety of veggie seeds and you should have seen the tears and I thought oh my gosh like, I don't really know this culture have I done something wrong why are they all crying like uh oh you know we overstepped the mark what have we done wrong here and it wasn't because we've done anything culturally wrong but for them, as great as that bag of food was, and they did appreciate it, it was going to fill their tummies for a bit longer, adding a bit more diversity to their cassava, cassava, cassava-based diet. By giving them the chickens and the veggie seeds, essentially we were giving them agriculture. These chickens could produce eggs, and they could have the eggs on a daily basis. Uh, they started growing the, the different types of vegetables, cucumbers, cabbages, tomatoes, so yes, diversifying their dietary intake, improving their nutritional intake, um, but also the additional produce that they were producing now, they used it to barter with other communities, other villages, and swapping it for things like papaya and bananas and stuff like that. So now they were diversifying their food supply even more. But essentially, they had an economic system based on agriculture at the most rudimentary level. And I'm really grateful for that. That happened in 2008. My, um, when did I last go to Fiji? 2009, but my parents go every single year in winter, even though they live in Queensland. I don't know what, what they're complaining about. Um, so they go to Fiji anyway every year uh, during winter. And that those villages are still doing the same thing. They don't have as cool farmer's markets as what you're talking about. Their farmers markets are little stalls on the side of the road which they sell to you know tourists who are going past. But they've had something that they never had before. And it means so much to them. Because of their direct involvement in their food supply, actually producing it, and the fact that they're so well aware of what could happen if they don't have food, it's not something that they take lightly. It's not something that is easy to waste. It's a very precious commodity. Now for others, Food is, is kind of a death sentence, or it can become a death sentence, depending on how their dietary intake uh, evolves over time. Now this particular individual clearly doesn't look uh, too well. They have a 
was very warm. Um, very, 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 very thin. It was like they're in a lot of distress, quite unwell. Um, clearly not a happy person. This photo was taken at the end of January 2009, and unfortunately, August of 2009, the same person uh, passed away from diabetes related complications. She had diabetes for over 20 years. Um, and while she did have access to dietitians and nutritionists who were helping her and advising her in her, in her dietary intake, um, I know she, for a fact that she has also got um, an MD as a child. Um, this person, and I've seen her diet, well, I, when, when I met her then, I, that was in January 2009. KFC, deep fried foods, those sort of things, lots and lots and lots and lots of miles bars. Eating it really rapidly, no mindful eating, um, was pretty much her diet. In the last two years of her life, she completely lost control of her bowel movements, so she had chronic diarrhea, or like that. Um, she eventually became blind and, uh, before she passed away. Now, it could be argued that uh, because of her family history of diabetes and diabetes related conditions, you know, her offspring could end up going down that route as well. It could be that, that could be true, it could be also her diet. But, you know, for a lot of lifestyle related health conditions, it is largely preventable or controllable by correct consumption um, of a variety of healthy foods. And you can have things like the chocolates and stuff as a treat item when it is consumed mindfully. Now, on the flip side of the scale, this little guy, no, he's no older than about nine years old. Uh, this is taken in South Africa. He's a native African child. So you're seeing a, a total shift in the, in the demographic population in a lot of developing countries. Um, he's clearly not what you would consider the picture of prime health, especially at that age, nine years old. Um, you can see in the background, in, in the same public beach area, there's, there's clearly a change in uh, the actual physical structure of the native population in this particular area of the world. Now, one of the issues that we're finding is that in countries that traditionally have been lower SES, have a low socioeconomic status traditionally, as they're moving into the middle incomes and earning a bit more money, having a bit more money available, most of them aspire for the Western lifestyle. Western lifestyle, including the highly processed, salt, fat, sugar, low dietary fiber, Western diet, um, complete in all of its glory, a more sedentary lifestyle, more reliance on cars and things like that. So we're having a shift, a paradigm shift happening in this sort of uh, environment where there's a lack of knowledge, even though they've got a little bit more cash available, to move away from their traditional foods more highly processed foods. Now, a solution to this could be easily to demonize food products like chocolate. It's very simple to do that. We've got the same problem in Australia. And we can demonize chocolate, we can demonize red meat, because you know, there's a lot of fat in red meat. Um, but what are the implications of doing that, apart from, you know, not savoring the food? But there's a lot more implications to that. I mean, that would be a simple solution in, you know, in the here and now. But by doing that, we're also affecting these guys. We're affecting the cocoa producer, or the cacao producer, all the way back at the grower stage. Now this is a real family from Ecuador, real cacao family, cacao family, cacao producing family. This was taken just last year, be their colleagues. And, and clearly they don't have issues with, you know, having a sedentary lifestyle and um, overconsumption of highly processed foods. However, if we did, you know, say for example, if we did demonize chocolate and in fact we just consume some, um, what is a source of temporary, temporary pleasure to us is actually their source of income and sustenance. So this farmer can provide for his family food, education, a future, based entirely on us actually consuming these products. And if we ban that and we demonize that, they go to their existence as well. So our actions towards food has a lot, has quite quite a, a fast spread. Which ironically 
we were moving away from Africa and Fiji and Ecuador, now we come back to Australia. And both the cherries, and everyone loves cherries. I don't know anyone who does not like cherries, especially in summer. We have a stack of them piled up on a nice pavlova on Christmas Day. It's like, yes, that's the pinnacle of Christmas Day. I live for that pavlova every year. Cherries are amazing. I look at these and I think, okay, firstly the pavlova, but I actually do a lot of research with these types of fruits. They're a great source of a compound called anthocyanins. Anthocyanins are the same things you get in red wine. So when I talk about anthocyanins, no one knows what I'm saying. Red wine, everybody knows what I'm saying. Red wine, everyone knows that. Have a bit of red wine at dinner and that's apparently good for your heart health. And it's because of the compound that makes the cherries red. It gives it the red color. It's extremely important at the cellular level in preventative health for a range of different health conditions. Um, so eating cherries is, is very much important, or any, any of these red type of fruits, because of my research, I would definitely promote them, but eating color, you've got all your bases covered. Now, for me to buy my cherries, it takes me all of, well really, it takes me 90 seconds to walk from my place to my local Woolies, and if I'm super lazy, I can get in the car and drive there in three minutes, because you've got to find parking and stuff like that. Um, and then you've got to go into the shops and it's air conditioned and you know I sort through the boxes and get my kilo of cherries and no wonder you know the amount of effort that I take to obtain those cherries it's no wonder that I could easily think that you know yeah it's pretty expensive at about 15 bucks a kilo but when you actually have a look at the reality of a cherry farm it's a lot different it's not air conditioned to start off with uh, lots of rows of the exact same looking tree. I mean, lots and lots and lots of rows of the exact same looking tree. You start picking from about 4 a.m. in Queensland. I don't know what Victoria would be like, but 4 a.m. in Queensland up until about 10, because it's just too hot to work during the day. So picking from about 4, well, you get up at 4, so you might start picking at about 4.30, um, till about 10 a.m., and then you sort, you grade, you wash, them into boxes and then you start picking again from about 3 p.m. till roughly about 5 or 6. You sort, you grade, you wash, you stick it into boxes. Cherry picking is all done by hand, not a machine, literally by hand and in the case of those previous cherries that was by my hand and a bunch of other cherry pickers. Um, it is full on. There's only so much of iTunes you can possibly listen to okay. and your batteries usually die halfway through the day. You can't go recharge either because there's no electricity. Um, so it is quite full on. It's a lot of hard work. And the thing that most people don't realize, that I didn't realize until I started doing cherry picking, is that you have to have a clean break between the stem and the branch in an upward movement. You can't just pull the cherry off the branch. If you don't do that, that spot will never bud again. And so that was a lot of responsibility on us pickers that we did the right movement because those trees, those spots where we got the cherry from, will not bud again. And that has an impact on the actual farmer. So his trees won't produce as much crop the next time. So that's going to have financial implications for him. So quite a lot of effort actually goes into our food supply. Now we're going to duck off overseas again. This steak is pretty amazing. Tell from the lighting that it is a very amazing steak. It's a 300 gram Angus beef steak. I had the steak in South Africa in 2012 and I took a photo because I take photos of my food. I'm one of those weird people who do that and then puts it up on the internet. Don't know why, but I do it anyway. Um, and it was pretty amazing. It was in it was the top steakhouse in, in Durban, three, three hat chef restaurant, whatever, it, whatever you call it. It cost $150 the meal, two course meal. First course was kudu and ostrich, absolutely amazing. Love kudu, love ostrich, does not taste like chicken, but it's, it's gamey, but it's nice. But by far, this part was the main star of the attraction. The sauce, the pepper sauce was awesome. The silver beet and watercress was sauteed with garlic. It was just phenomenal and caramelized red onion. And it was on a bed of sweet potato mash. And then there was this 300 gram thick, juicy Angus beef steak. And the reason why I picked it was because it was Angus beef from Australia <laughs> that I'm eating in South Africa. It's like, are you kidding me? The steak has made its way all the way over there. And this steak probably started its life.
like that on a property like this up in the Western Downs of Queensland on a Gravia property. So this is a, a colleague, friend of mine, Dudley Nicol. He's an engineer. He's an environmental scientist. He's also a Gravier, 30-something year old. He's the son of a vet Gravier, and it's been in their family for, I don't know. Unlike a lot of careers, which is something I found really interesting working out on farms, unlike a lot of careers in Australia, those who work in agriculture, especially out in grazing and um, in farming world, it's generational. It goes from one generation to the next. Essentially, the burden of my desire for cherries or Angus beef steak is placed on their shoulders at birth. Thank you. That's, that's their career path right from that start. Now, ideally for most of us, we hope that cattle are, are you know, being reared in a property like this, looks like this, lots of green grass for them to you know, roll around and enjoy themselves. And the truth is, during wet season in Australia, um, they do pretty much have access to grass and, and stuff like this. So during the six months of wet season, it's great. Uh, the graziers don't have to worry too much about food, but then we hit dry season. And that's the issue in Australia we have because our environment oscillates between flooding rains and severe droughts. So the dry season lasts from about April till October. It's about six months of the year. It's dry. And you would not say that that paddock in this picture is the same paddock seven months later. Same farm. Um, one of the main issues that they have, apart from the fact that we don't have rain, is that if you don't have sufficient rain and you've got high temperatures and it's dry, um, evaporation from surface water takes place. And in, the, in a year, you can have up to four meters of water evaporated from surface water. So I'm talking about dams, creeks, rivers, things like that. Now if you've got so much water being evaporated, firstly A, where's the livestock gonna get their water from? Um, so their managers have to be extremely efficient in their use of underground water, like you know the Great Artesian Basin and stuff like that. Um, but they've also got issues with not having enough food for the cattle. So that's when you have things like supplementary feeding. Now supplementary feeding can add up to six hours per day onto a farmer's workday. So in addition to everything else they gotta do, they gotta feed the cattle, it takes an extra six hours. I know for sure, I have 42 pigs at a doobie that I feed. Well, I don't actually feed, I have students doing it. Um, and they feed them twice, twice a day, and I've only got 42, and it takes four hours to feed 42 pigs food that I've already pre-packed for them. Like, come on. So they, these guys have got 1,200 head of cattle, so it can add up to six hours per day, per six hours of work per day onto their workload. Plus, Buying the supplementary feed, which is basically cotton seed, can cost up to $4 per head of cattle per week. And if you do the maths, over six months, you're talking at in excess of $115,000 just to feed these cows. Plus having a hiring additional staff to help feeding, and then also going out and scouting water. Now, why is this all so important? When we talk about environmental science here, apart from putting it into context, what they do. Well, the cattle, A, don't have enough water. They cannot convert poor quality grass into energy. They cannot convert poor quality grass or even the supplementary feed into energy. That is going to either result in death or it is going to affect their growth rate, as in their muscle growth rate. So that will directly impact on the tenderness and the juiciness and the texture and the quality of my meat. So one of the issues I find when I go out to these sort of places is how much space there is, beautiful, how much cows there are, they're pretty full on, how many cherry trees there are, and yet the scarcity of people out there, people like me, who want to eat my Angus beef in some random part of South Africa, or you know, enjoy my chocolate products from time to time. A lot of these properties are huge, there's a lot of work to be done, and yet there's not enough or sufficient people to actually consume the product, actually helping and going for a walk in dog shoes and seeing what it's like on the land on a day-to-day -day basis. 
I think if we actually step out of that comfort zone, and going to the farmer's market is one way to put it into context, but if we actually really go out and have a look at what some of these places are like, it, it actually can be quite a phenomenal and overwhelming experience to see how much effort goes into producing that kilo of cherries or that you know steak or pound of cherry tomatoes. So, the next time you eat a steak or you mindfully eat your chocolate or a slice of cake or have a sandwich that's composed, you know, you've got your bread, you've got your spread, your avocado, your veggies, whatever is in that, at least stop and think and pause for a moment and think about the actual processes and the people that have been involved to get that food that 10 minutes it takes for you to chomp that sandwich down. Ideally, it should be longer than 10 minutes. Um, so if you really appreciate and enjoy the pleasurable experience of eating the food. And when we do that, you really stop to think about it. Food impacts our food supply. It affects our society on the whole. Um, just, you just gotta go in anywhere in Melbourne and you just see so many restaurants. It's unbelievable. I lived in Canberra before I came here. And Canberra, you know, you can do everything give me any Canberrans, but you can do everything in Canberra in two and a half weeks, and then there's nothing to do in Canberra. Um, <laughs> it's the truth, I'm telling you the truth. Um, but then I come to Melbourne, and on my strip where I live, you just come down my apartment building, and there is five restaurants just in the bottom of my building. You just go walk down the road, less than 100 meters, and on either side, and we've got cafes and all that sort of stuff. It's the social culture is so much more different. Food can affect that. Food does affect that. It affects our own personal health, our health in the society, and the environment. So the key take home message I would like you really to get is that the food we consume is a reflection of our values, of who we are as individuals, and of how we value those that we actually offer the food that we create also a reflection of how we value those who put in the effort to get that food to us, to us as individuals, to us as a society, and to us 